Volcano, the Eruption and Healing of Mount St. Helens Chapter 3, Survivors and Colonizers After the big eruption, the north slope of Mount St. Helens looked like the surface of the moon. Searchers from helicopters looked in vain for human survivors here. In early summer of 1980, the north side of Mount St. Helens looked like the surface of the moon, gray and lifeless. The slopes were buried under mud, ground-up rock, pumice, and bits of trees. Ash covered everything with a thick crust. The eruption had set off thunderstorms that wet the falling ash. The ash became goo that hardened into a crust. The slopes looked like a place where nothing could be alive or ever live again, yet life was there. With the coming of warm weather, touches of green appeared among the grays and browns. There were the green of plants that had survived the force of the heat of the eruption. Some plants had still been buried under the snow of winter on May 18th. Huckleberry and trillum sprang up among the fallen forest trees. So did young silver firs and mountain hemlocks. In other places where the snow had melted, the blast swept away the parts of plants that were above ground, but roots, bulbs, and stems remained alive and underground. They sprouted, and hard, hardy shoots pushed up through the pumice and ash. Among these were fireweed, one of the first plants to appear after a fire. A few plants were even growing in blocks of soil that had been lifted from one place and dropped in another. Trillum grew and flowered. Huckleberry plants grew in stumped soil. Plants from the forest floor sprouted on the root wad of a fallen tree. Sedge grew through the crust of ash. Fireweed appeared through cracks in the ash. Ground squirrels were also underground survivors. Some small animals had also survived under the snowpack or below ground. There were chipmunks, white-footed deer mice, and red squirrels. There were pocket gophers, small rodents that carry food in fur-lined pockets in their cheeks. Ants survived underground, so did eggs laid by insects. Many other small animals, such as springtails and mites, lived through the eruption in their homes of rotting logs. Snow and ice still covered a few lakes on May 18th. Here, fish, frogs, salamanders, crayfish, snakes, and other water insects were alive on May 19th. Termites survived in rotting logs. Meta Lake, here shown in 1984, was protected by a cover of mushy snow and ice at the time of the blast. Its frogs, crayfish, and other animals were survivors. Natural scientists also found more kinds of bacteria than they could name, and they found fungi, which are sometimes called very simple plants. Fungi lack the green coloring matter called chlorophyll, and cannot make their own food, as green plants do. They take their nourishment from other living things, or from once living things, like rotting wood. Fungi can reproduce in several ways. One is by making spores, which are small as specks of dust. Fungus spores are everywhere. When conditions are right for them, they sprout and grow. In the summer of 1980, Scientists at Mount St. Helens saw fire fungi, which often appears after forest fires. Their spores need great heat to sprout. Both fungus spores and bacteria are very light, and they can travel thousands of miles on the wind. So no one could really tell which were survivors and which were colonizers. But even in the first summer, scientists could see many other colonizers arriving. The earliest came by air. Light seeds of willow and cottonwood blew in. Insects blew or flew in. 
and then there were the spiders, which bloomed in. Many kinds of young spiders spin thread of silk that remain attached to their bodies. When the wind catches these threads, it lifts the spiders into the air and carries them for miles. Willow seed travels on wind-borne clouds of silky fluff. Young spiders balloon in. This herd of elk is passing through a mud flow area. The scientist also saw animal visitors. Birds flew in, coyote, elk, deer, and other large mammals passed through, perhaps looking for food and water. The first summer, there were not many plants and animals on the North Slope, but there was a wide variety, so natural scientists were able to start studying the links among these forms of life. For no living thing exists all by itself. Each is linked to other living things and to its surroundings. All need food and places to live. Scientists knew, for example, that over a year or so, the crust of ash would break up and wash away. But they saw important small changes taking place in the summer of 1980. There were areas where snow lay under the ash. When the warmth of summer melted the snow, it no longer supported the ash. The ash simply slumped and broke up. Here surviving roots could send up shoots. Heavy rain sent water running down the slopes. The water cut channels in the ash. Here, too, roots could send up their shoots. Huckleberry plants thrive in a channel cut by running water. Deer and elk wandered through. They fed on some of the plants, but their sharp hoofs broke up more of the ash. Like other animal visitors, they brought in seeds. Some seeds had stuck in their coats. Others were in their droppings. Hoof prints and broken ash made places that trapped seeds. They made places where seeds could sprout and get their roots into soil. They made places where plants could grow. In times, these plants would form seeds. The seeds would colonize other places, and every plant that grew would help steal other forms of life. Hoofprints made hollows that trapped seeds and offered a place where seeds could sprout and plants could grow. Many times, scientists did not actually see the animals, but saw tracks or other signs of them. They saw coyote tracks, the tunnels of meadow voles, deer tracks, and kill deer tracks, among others. They saw a Pacific silver fir, a survivor, stripped of bark, a sign of a porcupine. They saw the tracks of a bear that had been eating huckleberries, and then they wandered up the mountain, perhaps looking for more food. There was none, but the bear left droppings that held huckleberries, and their seeds New plants may have grown from those seeds. In the summer of 1980, a few hardy plants, like this lupine, provide food and shelter to insects and spiders. It is an island of life in the gray wilderness.